And innovation is just not new product, it's beyond that. It is how you are distributing your products, how you are advertising, what kind of media choices you're making. Uh, privileged to have you with oh, us. My. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here and I enjoy working with entrepreneurs. So whatever impact I can create, I'm more than welcome. Thank you so much for that. So Harsh, I wanted to start uh, with the early days. You know, you started this brand, uh, the company Varico, about uh, 35 years ago. Uh, this was really a breakthrough for someone coming from a very traditional trading background. So if you could share the journey of why you decided to launch a consumer brand. So I'll start off from the college days when I finished studying at the age of 20 and I was not that bright like all of you. Just finished my commerce graduation and joined the family business, a typically family managed business with no professionals and we had different businesses. One of them was bulk edible oil business and uh, it was not doing well. I'm not a technical person so my understanding of technology is weak. I am not a kind of person who can go to Delhi and get a license. That's just not me. I'm not a good person for a B2B sales also. So my DNA is more towards doing things on my own, simple things which are, which don't mean talking to individuals or getting any favors from them, you know. So when I started looking at this, I realized that if I could convert that business from unbranded to branded edible oils, <clears throat> we would be creating strong brands and create a business which is far more sustainable and profitable. So I didn't have any clue what I was going to do in life, but it has evolved over a period of time just by experimenting, trying things. And I think that's been my life journey that you can go on trying, evolve and learn from them and make mistakes, but go on trying and go on improving and then growing. You know? So that's how I entered. Uh, we had these two brands, but they were sold mainly in loose. Parachute was sold mainly in loose in bulk tins. And our quality was much better than other competitors. So the retailer would buy big tins and sell it in loose at a premium. So then we said that if, if it is sold in loose at a premium because of better quality, can we not convert this into a brand? And that's how it started. The overall, at that time, I'm talking of early 70s, coconut oil was mostly sold as loose. So I saw an opportunity with economic growth that people will shift to to brand it and that's happened over a period of time. That time maybe 10% of coconut oil was was loose. Today 70, 60-70% is is packed. So the market has grown substantially and from the, our immediate aim was to gain market share and then increase market size as we became market leaders. Great. No, that that's extremely encouraging given that you know you had no background in consumer and obviously Yeah and I'll tell you some stories people get <laughs> because I nobody was Nobody has guided me from the top because no professional. So I had to find my own consultants. I had to identify my gaps and I had to learn everything from bottom up. In the area of HR, I didn't, we didn't even have, have an appointment letter, how to interview people. So gathered an individual consultant and did all the basics. In the area of marketing, I didn't know anything. I didn't know positioning. I didn't know advertising. So first thing I wanted to do when we appointed ad agencies, I want to learn advertising. So we spent one week with the ad, ad agency in learning from them how advertising is created, you know. Or work with a consultant in marketing and that consultant was based out of Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. And he, very renowned marketing professor, uh, but he said, I don't have time. I can only meet you in night, at night. So... Multiple times I've gone to Ahmedabad by the evening flight, discuss the whole night about all our marketing issues, learn from him and come back in the morning. So that hunger for improving, knowing from others, learning has played a very, very important role in my journey. And that's how I've learned everything from bottom up. And not being an MBA was, was also, I'm feel, I was feeling that, okay, if I have to create a strong branded company, I have to have very good talent. I have to employ MBS. I have to attract talent from companies like Levers or PNG or L'Oreal. So if I have to do them at the head, then I should be knowing what their language. So that made me read a lot. And I attended many short-term training programs, one week, 10 days, three days, just to learn all the, shall I say, management lingo, and you know, how, how the management students were. So I, today I can, 
I can be with any MBA student and talk their language. Interesting. Yeah. So you know, funny uh, anecdote uh, in my own experience. Uh, so I invested in a company called Licious. Yes, and I know that. They do the <laughs> yeah. you know meat yes. uh, home yes. delivered, and yeah. both the founders are non MBAs. Yes. And when they started the company, and I was investing in them as an angel investor, yes. they asked me, saying, "Boss." Do you think we'll ever be able to raise money because we are not MBAs? Ah. And today they have built such absolutely, a successful absolutely. business. So you know, that's uh, yeah. that's a great uh, yes. <laughs> insight yes. into that. Uh, Harsh, what were the early building blocks you thought very important to set the foundation for the business? So I think the first thing I realized was that you needed a differentiated offering. You know, so if you look at parachute, our differentiated offering was the quality of coconut oil, and over a period of time, we said that we can do innovations in packaging. The whole market was intense. We saw opportunity to convert the market from tin to plastics. It's cheaper than tins. It's uh, convenient to use. It's relatively more attractive. So, but we went through a lot of roadblocks with the trade, but we didn't give up, and we converted the market. We launched multiple options within plastics, and our market share just jumped up from fifteen percent to fifty percent. Over a period of four or five years, and we saw the same opportunity in Bangladesh, where we didn't have any presence, all local brands, the whole market intense, and from zero, to whatever we did in India, we did in much shorter period of time in Bangladesh, and today our market share is eighty percent Bangladesh, and we are the largest Indian FMCG company or Indian company in Bangladesh. So innovation has played an important role, but the key thing is differentiation. You know, you need to differentiate in the marketplace. In a highly competitive environment, you can't offer a meat product. So differentiation through in FMCG through through innovations, through pioneering moves like a brand like Revive was a pioneer. Even Safola positioning on health and offering health benefits a pioneering move. So I strongly believe that either you pioneer a new concept or have a differentiated offering. Which appeals to the consumer, where there is a certain critical mass. You don't want to be differentiated, and very few people buying it. So ultimately, it has to translate into, translate into a, a a good size business. And Harsh, uh, given that you know these are you know cherished brands for decades now, how do you retain that edge of differentiation? And what lesson would you, or what advice would you give uh, the new entrepreneurs, and how they should think about this? The traditional FMCG way of doing things versus the new age D two C brands, I see a, quite a lot of difference. You know, and one of them is in the area of brand extension. I am from the old school belief that okay, a brand stands for something, and that positioning of the brand, what it stands for, has to be something focal point of what the brand does over a period of time. It cannot strongly deviate from that. So parachute stands for purity. Nurturing, so it has to be whatever we launch under the brand parachute has to fit into that. It stands for certain brand colors, so the blue is the main thing. So in many of our extensions, we have a certain blue flag, but that has to be there across. So a consistent positioning over a period of time, don't change it often or don't change it at all. I think that just reinforces your positioning in consumers' mind, and you stand out for. That positioning of nurturing, love, purity. In case of Sapphola, it's it's health. We maintained that positioning for last thirty, forty years, you know, and don't deviate strongly from that positioning. And launches launch uh, extensions which will reinforce the mother brand. But uh, many other <laughs> new age brands don't do it. Maybe times have changed. Maybe because the way they are selling it is different. But that's my that's how we have done it in our traditional brands. Absolutely. No, I think uh, fundamentally, you know, the belief is very true that eventually brand love, or consumer love for the brand, yes. really comes over time, and you have to keep reinforcing the message. And I think some of our young entrepreneurs do forget that. So uh, I completely, you know, endorse with what you're saying on that. So, Harsh, what really happened is uh, over multiple decades. Wow. You have built a fantastic business. You know it's been you know acknowledged as one of the iconic businesses, uh, homegrown, competing with the multinationals. So, what were those building blocks that you put in place for seeing this kind of scale and sustaining it for so many years? So, I think one is portfolio choice. You know, where are you going to enter, and do you have a right to win? So, if you look at our portfolio of products, 
we are in most categories we don't fight with mncs so these are in theory term blue ocean spaces where there is a certain opportunity to become a pioneer to become a thought leader to become the market leader so identify spaces where you can be a market leader in terms of your portfolio and that means evaluating do you have any innovation or pioneering opportunity to enter that space and you know go on growing and that's how we have identified our categories where we are present where relatively the competition is not from mncs and relatively we have a higher right to win because of whatever we have innovation pioneering whatever else so i think that portfolio choices played a very very important role and if you look at our our overall turnover i think 95% of our turnover comes from brands or where we are market leaders in that particular segment now in shampoos we are only present in anti lice shampoos so in anti lice shampoo which is a very small category maybe 50 crore category we are source as as market leaders we acquired that brand from procter and gamble we have something like 80% market share but when you are a market leader when you are a dominant player in a segment then the brand is strong you have the pricing power and it gives you extraordinary returns in terms of economies of scale and financials so that's been our philosophy but we realize that over a period of time there are we are we don't have any opportunities for creating newer blue ocean spaces so now we are moving towards entering into categories where uh, we have a certain niche for example in can we exploit the coconut niche coconut is perceived to be a superfood so can we exploit that coconut niche and develop a range of products uh, we may be competing with mncs but in that particular niche we don't fight them because we have a strong brand so parachute has launched a personal products range through baby range in in bangladesh we also have a parachute shampoo in bangladesh and both have met with good response so we see ourselves as getting into spaces where we can leverage some of our brands and those niches where we stand for but it it doesn't directly compete with with larger categories where mncs are more active because i most mncs have, will have four or five brands say in shampoos is backed by global r&d we cannot match that you have to be realistic so in a way you could have said that it's a fear of failing against them or you could have said we did a smart thing by identifying some other categories where we could be winners i personally think it was it was doing a smart thing because we succeed in that and that's where we built a business which is a strong business coming to the organizational side of things yeah. and obviously uh, not only have you built uh, like you said you started with hiring mbas to yes. you know join the team and yes. uh, you know built a enviable organization yes and also you know very celebrated and talked about uh, the way you have planned your succession and yes. you know the whole yeah. transition yeah. if you could share a little bit of insight because again a lot of young entrepreneurs yeah. you know we yeah. find that at some point they yeah. don't scale uh, yeah. as fast as the yeah. business so i think first realization is there is a war for talent you have to win that war for talent and you have to give equal importance for winning in this attracting war for talent as much as you're giving it to your business in terms of whatever marketing your product or winning against your competition i think that's the first relation many entrepreneurs don't give as much importance to talent i think the first thing is to create the right employee value proposition to attract the right talent it's created over a period of time through perception based on the experience of individuals who work with you but what is that unique thing you are offering compared to your competition which will make talent come to you once the talent comes in you need to build a culture because just getting attractive talent is not enough you know you need to build a culture where talent will thrive and that requires a lot of effort it took 5 years for us to build a very strong culture it's very easy for anybody to to write down their values which will make them succeed but how do you convert those values from from values to culture is the biggest challenge and i think that's where most organizations falter for example ours we realized that we needed to create an innovative organization because innovation has played a very crucial role in marico's journey how do you create an innovative organization is through creating an environment of trust and openness innovation just doesn't happen in r&d labs 
it happens in everybody's minds in the organization so is there a way to capture the best ideas is there a way to ensure that people discuss their ideas with each other because i may have an idea but when i discuss with you i'll get some other new insight so it has to be discussed cost functionally so you need an atmosphere open and trust you need empowering because people have to be empowered so that means you enter into a situation where your organization structure is flat and people are forced to delegate but you equip that with very good quality talent so be empowered people at a much younger age uh, openness trust and then we have to encourage people to take risk because the biggest failure to uh, the biggest uh hindrance to innovation is fear of failure so you have to encourage people to take risk people to experiment many times things will not work out you will never get all the answers through market research you there is no shortcut to prototyping it trying out in the marketplace there are so many variables starting from a brand name to product to packaging to what you are offering the pricing the whole package cannot be done through market so you have to test out if you want to reduce your risk do it on a prototype basis in one small town or one channel or whatever but the key thing is to go on trying learning from your failures failures and i have had multiple failures you know it's not that. but if you are afraid of failing then i will not try only so we had to create that culture of innovation and i spent a lot of time in creating culture of innovation and then the role of top management is to reinforce innovation when somebody is making a presentation to you you have to ask what is the innovation you plan for the brand and innovation is just not new product it's beyond that it is how you are distributing your products how you are advertising what kind of media choices you are making so innovation across so everybody should think innovation uh, in the organization and uh, how does that uh, resonate with performance management because does it create uh, you know like you said fear of failure and therefore you know if i don't do well then my performance so if somebody has taken a risk and failed if it is well thought through and because you're not able to predict what will happen to the consumer you should not punish that person if that person is punished by not giving the right increment because they have not achieved results or by not promoting that person then you are sending a very strong signal that you are not tolerating failures and if you do that then people will stop taking risks so risk taking is very very important and the right signals have to go from the top that it's okay to fail and harsh you talked a lot about this in your book so i'm going to refer to that a little bit uh, about planning for succession yes i think it's a it's a huge you know question or concern in the minds of uh, pretty much everybody you know in any industry but certainly in the consumer space we are seeing that even with the younger founders that you know planning for uh, not just succession but also bringing in more talent into the organization yeah. if you could talk a little bit about your journey and how you managed that so successfully so the first of all in a highly in a fast growing organization you have to invest in competencies before time you have to predict if you are growing at 50, 30% per annum you have to look at what will you be after 2 years and getting those competencies is much earlier than 2 years because you don't want to be in a situation where you're getting growth but because you don't have good talent you're not able to deliver that growth whether it's manufacturing marketing sales whatever it is you know so fold the future backwards that's one number 2 you have to attract talent which is better than you competencies investment in competencies is very crucial for entrepreneurs and you can't wait until you have reach the level where you are falling short of competencies or talent you have to invest in advance and fold the future in you know think of what will you do after 2 years and can you imagine that and fold in your competencies because it is there is a shortage of talent and sometimes it can take a long period of time to get good talent and if you have that pressure of time you will compromise and select talent which is not optimal so i think it's better to invest in talent in advance having said that i think it's second thing i want to say is that in functional areas what i followed is if i have taking and i'm talking of going back in my early days a marketing and that person has to be better than me in the area of marketing then to that extent it's very easy for me to delegate to that person empower that person so i think these two broad areas i talked about culture building but to your specific question on succession management it happened to me at a much much later stage it all depends on the entrepreneur what they want to do in life there is no right answer but as and when you want to step into their succession planning shoes you have two options one is to look at internally another is to look at externally 
in case of promoters who have family managed business they also look at their own children i had that option of looking at my own son stepping into my shoes and that's the indian way of thinking i deviated from there because i didn't think uh, at that time was the right time for my son to get in i also had a professional who who wanted to step into my shoes and uh, he had been with me for many years if i had not promoted him he would have left and we could not have afforded that so i discussed that with the board and we concluded that he should step into my shoes uh and it'll be a new blood because i had built a business and for many many years so always when you have been there for a long period of time some new blood is always welcome so that's how i decided to step down though i had not thought of stepping down at that particular point of time but it's worked out well and uh, when i'm saying that i've stepped down it doesn't mean that i've abdicated my responsibilities he is reporting to me and if something goes wrong at his end then i am equally responsible for that so i have a mechanism where i get a good pulse of the organization i don't interfere on day to day basis i i have structured meetings with him and his team but he is given complete independence and uh, we exactly know how we going to operate what kind of decisions are going to come to me so there is absolute clarity in terms of his role my role and i think that's made my life also good i have had opportunity to do many more things which i couldn't have done earlier so and it's had a very good positive impact on overall performance of the company also so i wanted to actually jump into that uh, next phase of your life and yes. uh, you know you said that uh, the power of a business is in its purpose yes and obviously you've got you no know, multiple initiatives under the marico innovation foundation and you know the ascent program yes uh, would love to hear your perspective on you know when you define purpose uh, yes. what exactly is the north star for that and some examples if you could share so i think at one at a personal level let's me go and then we'll go to corporate level you know i think every person at some stage starts realizing and that happens a little later in life once in the initial stages you want to succeed you want to make an impact you want to earn money you want recognition uh, you want to feel good that you achieved many many things but at some stage after doing all that then you start questioning what now what next what next and i think that goes on in your mind you know and then you say okay what can i do next and that is the time that you start searching what is the purpose in your life you know why are you born what can you do to give something back uh, and it's a journey which each individual goes through one has to go through that it may take some time to identify a purpose but if you think that you're on the right track and once you've identified that then it can give you satisfaction which comparatively is much higher level compared to say monetary gains or you know uh, achievement gains or awards or recognition so i think purpose is very important for each individual and for each organization also let me shift now to the organization purpose i think it's very important to look at all stakeholders the belief is that the company exists only for shareholders that's a myth i think company has to exist for all the stakeholders so whether it's the customers employees associates who are working with you society and finally the shareholders because each stakeholder is interconnected to each other if you do something good for your customers or consumers in our case you will get better traction for your brands if that is better traction then all the other stakeholders will benefit and the same thing if you do it for any other for your own employees if they have a very good experience of working with you their motivational level will be much higher it will result in better organizational performance and all other stakeholders will benefit including shareholders so it's very important to look at stakeholder driven organizations rather than shareholder driven organizations and i think research has proven that any organization which looks at all the stakeholders has better financial results and this is research proven in us standard and poor index for many years so i happened to read a lot of that and we did some insighting in terms of what should be our organizational purpose and after doing a lot of insight we concluded that we have to make a difference to all our stakeholders much beyond what we are supposed to do so if, if it comes to working with an ad agency 
what else can we do so we have at our own expense we've sent our ad agency senior people to training programs which are being done in turn internally five day six day training program and they've benefited now when they see us adding value to them which they've not seen it coming from anywhere else i mean this their overall liking for us connection with us much much higher level they give us much more better in return you know so same thing with our packaging vendors we would go and improve their productivity sharing of best practices with our cnfa agents with our customers i'll talk about purpose driven our brands two brands but it has clearly shown that whenever you've done something extraordinary for each of our stakeholders it has come back to us in some way uh, and it is it is for the organization each and every person in the organization to play a role of adding value to make a difference to all the stakeholders love to hear some stories of you know sustainability or some programs that you so really talk of you know. two things initially i think uh, one is sustainable i can talk about you know it's i think uh, i'll talk about a recent example we are we have a marico innovation foundation which is a part of marico uh, it reports to me directly uh, and we uh, we do studies on innovative organizations we do rewards awards on innovative organization we work something like 20 organizations at a time in helping them scale up so these are organizations which have very innovative ideas but they don't know how to scale up and uh, we have seen that by involving i get involved the team gets involved the marico talent team gets involved we also have external advisors who are retired ceos we also take some of the challenges to management schools and give them a challenge and ultimately that translates into our recruiting talent management room they also enjoy those those challenges rather than our own company challenges so we have been able to add a lot of value to many organizations through this process uh, s for s technologies which is uh, having solar uh, drying of fruits and vegetables they were struggling they had very good products and they were trying to create their own brand and i told them this is not for you you know brand building distribution is very tough why don't you just shift your focus to horeca because all the mcdonalds and everybody they they want sun dried tomato so they've shifted and now they've they've reached 100 crore turnover you know uh, same thing is ishitwa ishitwa is a company which is making sorting machines and it's 6 tons per hour all the wastage and garbage and all that they sort out what any garbage whether it's plastics or anything else different types of plastics it sorted out very high speeds through ai uh, technology and they were struggling to sell their machines very innovative machines then we said that take part in some real estate exhibitions and now they are just they cannot cope up with the demand you know so a lot of initiatives in terms of acceleration projects and we have just and a lot of time whenever i spoke at any event and talked about this plastic example we converted the whole market from tin to plastic i'm very proud of that but at the same time i'm feeling guilty <laughs> that am i adding a lot of plastics to the environment which has a negative or bad effect so that was haunting me and then the team came up why don't we do a study on how can we reuse plastics how can we replace plastics how can we uh, recycle plastics and we engaged two consultants out of bangalore indian institute of science bangalore and praxis consulting and they have come up with a report which identifies 14 innovators in the plastic space that was the release of the report to me that was just the beginning our job is to have an impact of that report so currently we are in the process of creating an impact and working with this 14 innovators and ensuring that can you improve the circular economy can you increase more and more of this sorting out through machines like ishitwa can you improve the quality of plastic so that more and more quantity of plastics is reused by fmcg industries in their own packaging so currently we are in the process of helping them but i think if we are able to do that it will make a big big difference to the plastics and what's going into the environment that's amazing in fact a uh, lot of our founders even when they are very young companies yes. they are all very excited about this opportunity yeah so we i mean the report is for anybody anybody can uh, uh, look at the qr code and then you know if you want we can can share it with you or whatever in your but anybody can see it and i'm sure 
they'll benefit a lot and if anything more if they want any other help uh, we have a team working on how to create an impact through the plastic uh, study and you'll be more than happy to help that will be wonderful yeah. i mean we have actually been looking at solutions in this space yes. so we'll uh, you know separately link up with your team sure. on that one yeah it's very important that brands have a purpose strong brands have a purpose and i'll tell you two brands one was to have a purpose from the time we started so fola as a brand was started in 70s and positioned towards good for heart at that time so we at that time said that and it that okay can i improve the awareness for good preventive heart care so we came out with a booklet i'm talking early 70s and anybody wanting a free booklet had to send a postal stamp at that time 25 50 paisa and we would send a free booklet because we don't want people to ask for anything free and we must have discussed sent so many brands then we have had heart care camps for the brands of fola you know just free cholesterol checkups free heart care camps we have had multiple campaigns around world heart day in terms of better walking better lifestyle diet smoking drinking so without a direct connection to the brands of fola it's done through the fola brand the overall purpose of the brand has really helped the brand because the overall affinity to the brand is increased the brand loyalty scores have improved and all this is done because we we just had a strong purpose behind the brand we invest in that brand also we also have customized diets in india with so many communities you know customized diets if you are a north indian then you want north indian food i can't ask you to do south indian food you know? so how can you help you do customized diets which is good for your heart you know so multi- and that's continuing till day but i think what i'm trying to say is you have to invest in those things and don't look at short term return it will come back to you and it will give you more than adequate returns in terms of financial returns one more brand i want to give which didn't start up as a purpose brand but we converted it into about few years back the brand is nihar shanti amla so we started as in the amla category we started as a price for your brand where we were 25 30% lower than dabar amla it did well it succeeded but it remained discounted brand at a 25 30% lower price point then we said can we turn that into purpose driven brand and improve our pricing so we said that 5% of the profits of nihar shanti amla will be given towards education so we have been doing that for last 5 years and we'll talk about that in media so we appointed or we had vidya balan and she talked about what are the educational initiatives we are doing to spend this 5% of profit so these are done more through virtual means so teaching students to learn english improving teachers by uh, training teachers to uh, train students you know and because of consistent advertising and investment in this our brand scores have improved brand loyalty have improved and our we didn't have to discount the brand discount it dropped dramatically less so it has had a huge financial positive impact on the brand but started off by investing in purpose so I, all i'm saying is it's worth investing in purpose identify the right purpose for the brand it it happens at a time when your brand is a certain size you need not start with a purpose but i think it it pays to have a brand which is a purpose no that is uh, you know one of the big areas that uh, we have seen today's uh, generation of entrepreneurs yes. they have actually become far more uh, mindful about yes. wanting to build purposeful and responsible yeah. brands yeah. so this really resonates uh, with yeah. today's uh, generation so that brings me to my last uh, set of questions so harsh we have seen you know last decade and particularly last 5 years have been extremely seminal in terms of you know almost disrupting the whole consumer sure, brand situation sure. d2c yes, direct to consumer yeah. how does a company like marico you know address and you know see this as an environment in which you know do you need to make some changes or you continue to do what yeah. you're doing so i think first of all any disruption could be a threat it could be an opportunity we are viewing it as a opportunity okay i think that's the starting point if you are viewing it as a threat then you will start protecting your risk but you are viewing it as a part opportunity then you will be a part of that opportunity so that is the starting point you know so take the biggest disruptor in fmcg in my journey is the emergence of d2c brands because all the entry barriers whether it was distribution or whether it was big advertising budgets have gone down you can 
promote a brand through digital marketing, you can go through e-commerce places. So the entry barriers have dramatically reduced. So one way of looking at it would be that, okay, all the D2C brands are coming up. What do I need to do to protect my brands? Other is to say, I'll participate in D2C journey. So what we have decided to do is to actively participate in D2C journey, but not in the same way of managing FMCG brand. The biggest thing is, these brands have to be managed in a different culture. Different mindsets are required. The traditional FMCG mindset will not work for that. So you, you have those brands, even physical location is different from Marico. So that Marico will not have any, culture will not have any impact. Because Marico marketing is used with huge budgets. Here you have to do with very small budgets. And you have to go on experimenting, prototyping, continuous touch with communities, customer insighting through digital means. Very young group, and we acquired, we have acquired till now three brands, and we also have our three of our own brands because it's just not acquiring brands, but how do you build D2C brands? So, this whole opportunistic mindset has helped us understand this space much better. Of course, we have to grow much bigger. I think today we may be in the range of about 300 crore turnover in D2C, but over a period of time, we have to reach a level of 1000 crores or so. And you are seeing this, uh, you know. Marrying the two cultures and... You know, so at some it. stage, they will start integrating. And once the brand reaches a certain level, then we start using our distribution network to rolling it out because that's where we can add a lot of value. 80% of most D2C brands or the categories they are in, sales comes from physical. So we have an advantage without any extra cost. We can roll it out. We can use our own distribution network to roll them out. At some stage, you will start integrating them. But we have best... Uh, practices best sharing lessons. What did D2C do? What did FMC do? What is learning for each other? Which happens once in a few months, they sit down and discuss with each other. You know? And within brands also, there is a best practice sharing, you know, because we have one Beardo brand, one Just Herbs, one True Elements, so all are different categories. So they meet and share amongst themselves what is working. Thank you so much, Harsh. Uh, 45 minutes is a very short time to <laughs> learn from you. We could go on for hours. But, uh, you know, once again, you know, Thank privilege you so to talk to you. To and to I'm you, sure a yeah. lot of, lot of young entrepreneurs will uh, derive a lot of inspiration from, uh, from this uh, Thank conversation. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.